Today's webinar is on automating the Gromax tools on clusters. If you're joining today, I suppose that uh, most of you, perhaps all of you, are already familiar with at least running simulations with Gromax. But Gromax is a big software package. It is much more than just the MD engine, which would be, say, the GMX MD run program. Gromax also includes tools to prepare simulations, such as the uh, pre -pro -pro processor Grom PP or a PDB to GMX for converting uh, structures, and also a large number of post-processing and analysis tools like TrashConv, RMS, Energy, etc. You probably know that the MD engine is well suited to HPC environments, and that's also the case for MD engines from other packages such as uh, NameD. It's highly optimized for parallel computations. Uh, Gromax has support for process-based parallelism, threads-based parallelism, even GPUs. So you can use it with many cores, many nodes, even many GPUs to accelerate your simulations. And it's reasonably easy to script um, and submit as jobs to the scheduler on the clusters. However, the Gromax analysis tools are very different and they are more challenging to use on, to use on HPC. Um, they were really developed for, work, for a workstation. Uh, they expect people to be working interactively. So they ask for interactive input, typically to specify atom selections, um, which doesn't work in a job script. Also, they typically do not work in parallel. The analysis tools use one CPU core. They do one thing at a time and that's it. They're also not so easy to script because there is no interface for your favorite programming language, whether that is Python or R or something else. However, uh, it's possible to work around these limitations. And this is what today's webinar is all about. Um, so typically, the Gromax analysis tools, they would work well on your laptop or your workstation, but that wouldn't be practical because the output files would need to be copied from the cluster to your PC. Okay, maybe for small projects, short trajectories that works, but as soon as you get into large trajectories, that all breaks down. And today, all trajectories are pretty much in the order of several gigabytes of storage. Uh, so really running the Gromax analysis tools on the clusters is better. You don't need to copy the files back and forth. And of course, you get access to much more processing power. I will present a number of techniques to automate the Gromax tools and run them in parallel. Um, the most important topics will be the first three, uh, avoiding interactivity with input redirection and running analysis in parallel with job arrays. We'll see basic job arrays, but also using job array arrays with multi-dimensional input. The four other sections are shorter and they're really a bonus. Uh, we won't have time to cover all this material. I'm afraid it's just a little bit over an hour, so we can choose according to your own interests. Uh, one thing I would like to cover, however, is speeding up analysis um, using trajectory post-processing. So we'll jump to this chapter after we're done with the basics, and then we can select according to uh, what is your favorite topics, perhaps talking about GNU Parallel or MD Analysis. So. Um, in all the examples that I'll cover today, I will be using uh, data from a research paper that I published a few years ago with my colleagues in Germany. We were studying a peripheral membrane protein called anixine. We can see anixine here on this figure. It is the protein sitting on top of this DOPC bilayer. This is a MD simulation system. So we also have water. So this is really a DOPC bilayer, a protein on top, and everything inside a big box of water. In that paper, we were interested in water diffusion and how it is slowed down in the vicinity of membrane proteins and bilayers. Um, it was a joint analysis using both MD and NMR spectroscopy. And in NMR spectroscopy, 14 annexin residues were replaced by probes that were able to measure water retardation, or that means the uh, amount by which water diffusion is slowed down in the vicinity of a residue. In these examples, we'll be using first one 
uh, trajectory of 100 nanoseconds. Trajectory acquired for this system here. So this is a typical trajectory with frames saved every 10 picoseconds. However, frames every uh, 10 picoseconds is really not close enough to measure water diffusion because water diffusion happens on the picosecond and sub-picosecond time scale. For that reason, we also recorded trajectories recorded with frames every 0 0.1 picosecond. However, if we did this for a full 100 nanosecond trajectory, that would be very large, a very large trajectory. So instead, what we did is we used the 100 nanosecond trajectory to spawn 10 small trajectories at regular intervals. Each trajectory is only one nanosecond long and has very closely spaced frames. And in today's webinar, we'll do examples where we will use either the 100 nanosecond trajectory, or we will compute for the 10 small trajectories at the same time to show how we can do things in parallel. We also have 14 amino acids, the 14 NMR probes that we're interested in. So this allows us to do a number of examples with 14 or even 140 calculations that we want to do in parallel. To uh, follow these examples and to repeat them later for your own research, um, there are a couple of things that I want to make clear. Uh, first, I will be doing these examples on a local cluster from the University of Saskatchewan called Plato. However, it is very similar to Alliance clusters. It uses the same software stack. So all the examples here will work directly on Alliance clusters. Whenever there's an interactive command, it is given in the slides. And however, most of the work happens in scripts that have been pre-written, and I will discuss them extensively during the webinar. All the scripts are available in an archive. Alex already put them on the WestDRI page, and I have a backup direct link here. Um, the trajectories, unfortunately, are not included in the script archive simply because they're much too large. However, the scripts can be adapted easily for your own trajectories, your own research. The slides are also available as a PDF. Again, they're on the WestDRI webinar page already, and there's a direct link as a backup too. Now let's get started with our first example, avoiding interactivity with uh, input redirection. We will compute backbone RMSDs for a, uh, the alpha carbons, uh, sorry, for the backbone of annexine after a minimizing fit to alpha carbons. So this is really a typical check that you would do after any simulation to make sure that it's stable. And first we'll do this in an interactive session and then we will progressively make things um, more sophisticated going to um, scripting this analysis. So I'm connecting to my cluster. And I will request an interactive job on a compute node. Here are the simulations. We have a short equilibration. Then we have the large 100 nanosecond trajectory that we will mostly use. And we have the 10 small trajectories that we use to study water uh, mean square displacements. Let's start with our large 100 nanosecond trajectory. So we have the um, typical output files from a Gromax simulation the resulting structure, the trajectory, our topology. And now we want to compute our, M our, M our MSDs. I will start by checking the available Gromax modules on my cluster. I will use the latest Gromax 2022 and check how I can load it. I am told that it's for this software environment the GCC compilers, and it uses the OpenMPI parallel library. So I load this tool chain. And then I can load my Gromax version. All right, I'm ready to start my RMSD calculations.
I will do it just for the first five nanoseconds of trajectory. This is what I will do for almost all these examples because otherwise it would take too long and we wouldn't get to finish within reasonable time today. However, that's really just for the sake of example. Sorry about that, what's happening there? Okay, sorry, I'm not even sure which typo I made, but um, okay. So we've started our calculation and now um, we choose our index groups. Let's do an, a least square fit on the alpha carbons and output for the backbone. So I'm selecting the groups three and four. All right, so this is really typical of interactive use for the Gromax tools, but you can already uh, feel the problem there. If you have a very large trajectory, uh, you don't want to leave an SLOC session open like that overnight. Um, and perhaps you have many trajectories to work on in parallel. Well, you would like to work them uh, in parallel. So clearly this is not sufficient. Let's relinquish our interactive uh, session and then move on to um, showing how uh, scripts can sometimes be problematic. I will start by creating a directory for my analysis. And now I want to repeat this RMSD analysis. But in a job script. So as you can see, I'm copying from this GMX tools here. These are the pre-written scripts for this webinar. And I'm going to show you the script. So this is really a typical batch job script. We have uh, its batch instructions. We load our modules. And then we do our RMSD calculations. So exactly the same as before. This time, however, I decided to do my analysis in a separate directory. So I will specify where to find the simulations using this simdir variable. I like doing this because it is cleaner. You can separate your analysis from the simulations themselves. We run GMX RMS. And perhaps you can already imagine what the problem with this job script will be. We didn't really specify the index groups that we wanted to use for the fit or for the output. In fact, there are no command line options to do this. And so our job finishes very quickly with an error saying, cannot read from input. And the reason is that it was trying to read the group for the least square fit, but of course there was no answer since this was happening inside the job and we didn't, we didn't have an attached terminal so that we could answer the question. So how do we solve this? Um, one way to do it is to use a separate text file to specify the index groups. And the text can be passed to GMX RMS using input redirection. If you're already familiar with bash redirection, you know that this smaller than sign here can be used to redirect output from a file. So let's try that. We update our RMSD script, and now we also have a selected groups text file. If we check this selected groups, it's actually just two lines. And these lines correspond to the groups that we want to use to do the fit and choose what selection to output. Our RMSD script has been updated with a very simple change. Instead, of, um, well, we added this little bit here with uh, the smaller than sign to redirect output from the new text file. And this actually solves our 
input problem and allows Gromax to compute RMSD and choose the index groups correctly. So this should take a few seconds to run. Uh, you might already be thinking about an issue with this approach. However, having a text file that contains just three and four here is really not very clear. What do these numbers refer to? If you're very familiar with Gromax, well, you might remember that three and four are the alpha carbons and the backbone, but frankly, that's not very clear and we'd like to do something better than that. Fortunately, Gromax also allows you to um, choose index groups using their explicit names rather than numbers. Okay, meanwhile, our example finished running. Let's have a look at our input. This time, the selection proceeded for the minimizing fit and then proceeded also for selecting the output group. The frames were read and eventually the tool returned with success, also giving, uh, telling us which uh, groups were used for the selection. All right. However, um, as I said, this is not ideal. Um, we would like to do something a bit better. So we can use a different version of the selected groups.txt file that contains the explicit names of the selections. And I recommend that you use this instead of plain numbers. I'm not going to rerun the script right now. It's uh, pretty much, it would give exactly the same results. We can even check that we did give uh, reasonable numbers for our uh, RMSD. If we check the start and the end of the uh, output file, we can see the expected Gromax headers and the time series that goes on until five nanoseconds. Now, this is not a bad solution, but it's uh, possible to do even better. Having separate file, a separate file to select the index groups and, well, another for the script, that becomes a bit confusing and you have to go back and forth between the two files to know what is actually happening. Fortunately, it's not necessary. There's a bash feature that we can use for that called a here document, which allows you to inline the index group selections inside your script. And we'll show one last version of our RMSD script for this. All right, so what do we have here? As usual, we load the modules, define the uh, input directory for the simulations, and we run Gromax RMS. But this time we have something new that might look a bit surprising if it's the first time you see a bash here document. We have two smaller than signs followed by a dash followed by an EOF marker. And if we go to the end of the script, we see a second EOF marker. Everything between these two markers is the here document. That means those two lines here. And the contents of the here document will be copied to the standard input of the program. So this is exactly the same as if you had the separate selected groups.txt file with these two lines. So the here document is a really nice technique that allows you to have only one file to contain both your script and your text data that you would like to pass to the script. Um, just a couple of details here. So there are different ways to do um, here documents in Bash. In fact, sometimes you will see just two smaller than uh, signs and no dash here. The dash allows you to indent the contents of the file and the leading tab characters will be ignored. So this makes the script somewhat more readable. The uh, EOF marker also is arbitrary. You could replace it by something else as long as it matches the marker that you use at the end. Uh, however, EOF is rather a convention, so I suggest that you stick with that.
okay, so we're about to wrap this first section. Uh, in conclusion, here documents are really the best way to select index groups uh, with the GrowMax tools in scripts. Uh, I should mention that some GrowMax tools do have command line options for selections. Um, for instance, MSD has a dash cell option that allows you to uh, select water molecules to compute MSDs for. Uh, the SASA tools for solvent accessible surface area has two options, surface and output. However, that's not the case for the majority of tools. For instance, RMS that we just used has no option at the command line for selections. And it's not clear if the GrowMax tools will ever be updated to include the ability to specify selections on the command line. So I suggest that you learn to use here documents when you use the GrowMax tools on clusters. All right, we're ready to go into running analysis in parallel using job scripts, uh, using job arrays, sorry. Uh, before we start, I uh, will go over the chat and see if we have any questions here. I see one. I have issues in md.mdp file. Can you please tell how to change the values at ns steps in md.mdp file for 100 nanoseconds? Um, I'm not sure what is the context of this specific request. So if you could perhaps uh, give a bit more details in the chat, I will come back to these questions later. Um, are you trying to um, change this value for your own research or? Okay, so and a step, I can have a quick look at this. So let's say the grumpy.mdp. So I should, okay, so N steps. Uh, so first that would not be N S S steps. That would be just N steps. Um, and you can uh, change, put a different number here. It always needs to be an integer. You cannot say 100 nanoseconds. You need to give just a number of uh, steps to complete. Uh, the number of steps times the uh, integrator frequency will give you the um, no, will give you the length of the simulation. For instance, if I want to do this in a very detailed manner, I could say that this value of is so. This is the number of steps. If I give the integrator value in femtoseconds. At least I would have, um, uh, sorry. Um, sorry, no, that's correct. So, okay, I see that you have it here. So this would give you uh, the number of picoseconds in the simulation. And if you divide by 100, I would say you have 100 nanoseconds in the simulation. So this is, um, how that would be done to change the number of steps in the simulation. All right, let's go on with running analysis in parallel using job arrays. We'll do a slightly different um, computation. Here, we're doing no longer RMS deviations. Instead, we'll compute distance time series. Uh, we'll compute the distance between the 14 amino acids that are of interest to us. Those are the residues used as probes in NMR spectroscopy. So the difference between these residues and the DOPC bilayer, which means this time we have not one, but 14 calculations to perform. And we'd like to do these in parallel. The first step will be to prepare index groups for these distances. So we need 15 index groups in total one for each residue and one for a DOPC bilayer. Uh, making index groups is a small operation that's not intensive, so it can be done on the login node. And we'll do so using the standard GMX select tool. But just for fun, I will show you how you can use a here document, again, to automate GMX select, even though it's a simple operation that doesn't happen on compute nodes, here documents can still be helpful for you just to record your work in a script that you can run over and over 
and modified and adapt for uh, new projects instead of working interactively and having to type everything over again. So I'm creating a new, a new directory for my analysis. I will copy the bash script that I'm going to use to build these index groups. So we have our usual module load instructions. We define the root of the simulations and then we start JMX select. And here we can see again, a bash here document to automate creating the indexes. We have one for the bilayer and we have one for each amino acid. So typically you would run JMX select and then you would type all this manually, but it's actually possible to do it in a script and that's much more convenient. We run this script and we end up with our groups.ndx. You can see we have a group for the bilayer and then we have the other expected groups for the amino acids. Great, now we're ready to run our um, distance calculations themselves. Let's start with what not to do, a uh, naive approach that uses a loop and therefore is not doing anything in parallel. The idea is not to tell you that yeah, you could be doing this this way to tell you, well, if you think about doing it that way, that's probably not a good idea and you should do it differently. So this is what you might be thinking of doing, uh, creating a variable, an array for all the residues that we're interested in, and then using a loop over these residues calling GMX min dist every time for a different residue. So the residue uh, number is in variable i and I reuse this i variable to set different output names for the different output file names and to use different selections. So this is um, another interesting note. We're using a here document again to tell MinDist that we'll be computing the distance between the bilayer and one annexin residue. And we can see that we have a bash variable inside the here document. And that's actually perfectly okay. You can uh, make your uh, here documents uh, flexible and dynamic by including variables in them. So we have our MinDist job script. Let's submit it to the queue. It is running and after a few seconds, it will start outputting results for the distance calculations. I can see it's already working on the first amino acid. So I have distance for residue number 12. However, that's going to be very slow. You will see that after about say 10 seconds or so, it will start working on the second amino acid. So I'll have to wait for the 14 to be finished. Uh, and if you have more than 14, or if you're working on longer trajectories, then this becomes inconvenient. That's much too slow. We would very much like all the amino acids to be treated in parallel. I will therefore cancel this job and find a better way to do it. Now, the second attempt is again, what not to do. You might be thinking, well, I'm going to use a loop to submit several jobs. This is very intuitive and it sounds like it would work very well, but it's actually a problem. I want to illustrate it first, not to tell you to do it, but rather because I think this is something that you will think about doing intuitively. And I want you to be able to recognize this so that you don't actually do it on clusters. So let's, Start by clearing up our directory. We no longer need the output files from the previous attempt. We're just keeping our groups index file. I will use two scripts.
The first one, submit Mindist, will submit 14 jobs. And the second one here is the job script that is used 14 times. Let's have a look at those. First, submit Mindist is a simple script. It defines an array for the different residues and then it loops over them using sbatch every time to submit a job script. And it gives the uh, residue number to that job script as a positional argument. Uh, perhaps this is the first time you see this. Uh, when you use sbatch, not only can you give the, no the name of the file to submit, but you can also pass positional arguments. And a positional argument will be used in the second script. We load our Chromax modules, define the root of the simulation, and then say the residue number i is going to come from the first positional argument, which is actually the only positional argument that this script receives. Then we start the min disk calculation in exactly the same manner that we did in the previous script. So we're outputting to a different file for each residue, and we're selecting the bilayer and the appropriate residue. But since submit mindist will uh, submit 14 jobs, that means I will have 14 calculations. Uh, oh, sorry, that's really not how it's supposed to be done. I will cancel everything and do it again. So what I'm expecting to do here is actually to run this submit mindist script on the login node, and it will submit 14 different jobs for me. If I use SQ, I can already see that these jobs are running in parallel. And if I check what's in my directory, I can already see that all the residues well, all the distance time series are being computed at the same time. It all looks pretty nice. So why do I say you shouldn't do it? Well, using a loop to submit jobs is a problem on clusters because each time you make a call to sbatch, it sends a remote call to the job scheduler. And if you have a large number of calls that can make the scheduler unresponsive. Here, I submitted only 14 jobs on a cluster that's not too busy, not a big problem. However, if you submit hundreds of jobs on an alliance cluster, then the job scheduler becomes unresponsive for everybody. And that's really annoying. So really, you mustn't do um, this kind of stuff. There are also other disadvantages to using a loop to submit jobs. Uh, the first is that there is no match between the input that you give and the uh, Slurm output file names. If I look at the listing here, I have one file for each amino acid, but they're called with just the job, the job number here like this. I have 14 of them in the same directory. There's no way to know which one is for which distance calculation without looking inside the file. So that's not very practical. And it's also harder to rerun crashed or new calculations uh, than using the next tool that I will show, which is a job array. Job arrays are a Slurm feature that is specifically designed to submit multiple similar jobs in an efficient manner. And it does so using only one batch script, which is repeated a number of times. So let's um, try now to repeat the parallel calculation we just did, but this time using a job array. Again, I will clear up my directory and keep only my index file. And I will pull another example from the script archived. Yet another version of MinDist. This time, it has a new option, sbatch dash dash array. If you haven't worked with Slurm arrays until now, this is new to you. And this is how you start a job array. There's actually nothing more than that to using the array. Or actually, no, that's not quite right. I should say this is the first half of um, using a job array. This is how you define the different input values for which the array will run. Here, we have 14 values. 
one for each amino acid. So again, it's the index of the amino acid in the protein. This script will run 14 times, one for each value in the array. And each time it's run, Slurm will set the variable Slurm array task ID to a different value. So the first job here, the first array step, we call it. In the first array step, Slurm array task ID will have a value of 12. In the second one, Slurm array task ID will be 16, etc. until the 14th job, which will have Slurm array task ID equal to 260. So this is actually the uh, residue index we're interested in. So we always use the variable i to store our residue index. So I will set i equal to Slurm array task ID. And I will repeat the same calculation we've done up till now, starting the mindist calculation, outputting to a specific uh, file, and selecting the correct residue. We submit job arrays in exactly the same manner as regular jobs, but it's one call to sbatch that generates many jobs. I immediately list the jobs with SQ, and I can see that I have one job number, but with an array here, 12, 16, and if I could see a longer, uh, if I could have a longer uh, column, I would see more of them. If I do SQ now, all the 14 jobs that were submitted in the array are currently running, and they will perform the calculation in parallel. So I can already see my output uh, files being created, and now the array is already finished. And if I look, have a look at the uh, output file from Slurm, this time they are much more convenient. I have the job ID, but I also have the value for the array step. So I know exactly which output file goes which, with which amino acid. Job arrays are very flexible. Here, I've used them with a number, well, with 14 residues, but I could do something different. I could use ranges, for instance. Um, this example would submit 11, uh, would submit an array with 11 steps, one to 10, followed by 15. You can also use job arrays to uh, run multiple jobs, but to set a maximum to the number of jobs that can run at the same time. For example, here, this array 1 to 100 um, person sign 10 would mean run 100 array steps from 1 to 100, but run maximum 10 of them at a given time. This can be useful to avoid overloading a file system. Um, to be honest, typically this doesn't happen with Gromax because Gromax uses uh, a single trajectory and it's so it's only opening one file at a time. But if you use job arrays for uh, different things and you need to open many files at the same time, perhaps at some point you will get an email from uh, an alliance analyst saying, you, oh, can you please um, submit fewer jobs because you're hammering the file system? Well, this is a very good time to use a job array because you could say, okay, I'm going to repeat my hundreds or my thousands of calculations but I'm going to only run 10 of them at the same time, so I know that the file system won't be overloaded. Array jobs also um, make it easy to run new steps or to rerun past steps, for instance, if they crashed. Uh, here's an example. Let's imagine that amino acid number 12, the calculation just crashed in the middle, and we have a new NMR Pro 252 that we want to compute distances for. Well, you can just resubmit the same job script, but this time we override the dash dash array option on the command line by giving the uh, steps to compute or recompute. All right, if you have any questions on job arrays, feel free to um, mention that in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them. If not, we'll get started on a more advanced use of job arrays with um, multidimensional input.
Okay, so I see one question. Uh, would you su suggest submitting longer analysis um, to the clusters? If so, what resources should be requested? Okay. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by longer analysis, uh, more than 20 minutes to several hours to the cluster. Uh, I mean, if I add analysis of 20 minutes to several hours, I would definitely prefer to do them on the cluster. But uh, I'm not sure what you mean longer than what compared. If, yeah. Uh, yeah so ahead. it looks like the when you show your job queues, it looks like the maximum time is 20 minutes. So for some of the analysis, I have longer trajectories, longer than 100 nanoseconds. And so the analysis takes quite a long time. So like up to several hours. Okay, thanks. That's, uh, I, I, I didn't pick up on that. Um, in these uh, scripts, I kept them uh, very uh, simple. So I actually didn't request any specific time. However, uh, 20 minutes is the default that I'm given on the Plato cluster that I'm using. I could simply change those job scripts here. For instance, if I have an array, I could say, time six hours, and this would request six hours for each step in the array. So that means if you have several analysis and they last several hours, you can still submit them to the cluster just by making sure to have this time option and it can be used in conjunction with the uh, array option. In fact, any um, S batch option can be used in conjunction with the dash dash array. Now onto the second part of your question, which resources should be used, nodes and tasks per nodes, et cetera. When you're doing analysis, typically you don't want to change anything. You just use the default, which is one CPU core. The reason is that the Gromax analysis tools, they don't work in parallel. They only work on a single CPU core. Right now, we are doing parallel analysis by submitting multiple jobs that each use a single CPU core. So we're achieving what is often called a trivial parallelism, or we can call it an embarrassingly parallel problem. However, typically, you don't set the dash dash nodes or n tasks per node options for the analysis. You would use that only when submitting your Gromax simulations themselves. So when you call GMX MD run, use uh, n tasks per node, CPUs per tasks, dash dash nodes, but when you're running the analysis, don't put any of these options. Thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Uh, yeah. All right. I think we're ready to jump to multidimensional input. So in the uh, previous example with uh, a job array, we had only 14 residues to compute. So that was actually a rather, say, simple example. It worked very well because it matched perfectly the way Slurm defines job arrays. Uh, you give a number of indices, the array steps, and for us, they just matched the residue numbers. That's great. Sometimes, however, you have more complex situations. Let's imagine, for instance, that we want to compute mean square displacements of water molecules in the vicinity of our 14 NMR probes but this time not in one trajectory, in 10 trajectories. If I go back very quickly to the system that we're using for these examples, we have our NMR probe on the annexine, and we said running a 100 nanosecond simulation, uh, simulation with very closely spaced frames would be too much, would occupy too much disk, frame, uh, disk space. So instead we have 10 short trajectories. So now we want to compute uh, MSDs. We want to compute MSDs for 14 amino acids and 10 different trajectories at the same time. So this means we have in total 140 calculations to perform. And of course, we'll be using a job array for that. It's the perfect tool. But how do we actually specify our dash dash array option? That's not so trivial because Slurm job arrays are actually one dimensional. Each step in the array is a positive integer. So they start at zero, one, two, et cetera. 
And that does not match our two input variables now. So we need to convert between having multiple input variables and a single linear job step that Slurm will accept. How can we do this? There are actually not a single right way to do it, but here I want to show you one technique that is easy, that works all the time, uh, irrespective of the number of variables that you're dealing with, and that's reasonably easy to understand too. The trick is to store all the uh, variable combinations that you're interested in, in a text file. Then the array step becomes the line number in that file. For instance, here we have 14 amino acids and 10 simulations. So we have it, we will create a text file that will start with the line with 1201. So amino acid 12 for the trajectory 01. That will be followed by 1202 until the last simulation. So we have line 1210. Then we go to the next amino acid. So we start again at trajectory one, then 16.2 until 16.10. We do all the amino acids. And at the very end of the file, we'll have the last one, 260 with the last trajectory. And of course, we'll have 140 lines in uh, this file. Each line number can, uh, well, becomes the array step in our job array. So let's put this into practice, and it's actually easier to wrap your head around it when you see it in an example. Again, we create a new directory for our analysis. We copy a first script from the archive called make MSD vars. This is the script that we will use to generate the text file containing our variable uh, combinations. We define two arrays, the residues we're interested in and the trajectory IDs. And we use two loops, one over the residue number and the other over the trajectory number. And we use this to populate a text file MSD vars. Once that's over, we can actually check that our file really contains the expected values. And we have 140 lines. We're ready to submit our job array. So this time, we use the dash dash array option with steps one to 140. So this script will be called 140 times. And now we need to take the job, uh, the array step from the slurm array task ID variable. And we know that this value now is the line number we're interested in, in the msd vars.txt file. So we need to retrieve the variables i and j from the line number in the file. We do this using sed, which is a, a Unix utility for text manipulation. Sed can be used for search and replace to um, cut and paste, get lines, etc. Here, we use a sed command that says, wait until you're at the appropriate line number, then return that line and quit. In the meanwhile, just discard the lines that you encounter. Now, there is also a redirection operator here that might be a bit surprising if you haven't seen it yet. This is called a here string. It's somewhat similar to the here documents that we showed earlier, but this is used with a command substitution to get the line from the file and pass it to the read command that will put the uh, the tokens on the line, so the two words, the, the two indices in variables i and j. And then we can use these variables to pick the right simulation, so from one to 10, and then operate on the correct amino acid. We start with jmix select to create an index group 
for the water that is close to the amino acid. So we call it shell because it's a water shell around the amino acid. So we say select from the water within five angstrom of the residue. And then we call GMX MSD outputting to um, files that contain both the uh, number of the amino acid and the trajectory. And that's it. So let's submit the script to the job scheduler. And now we actually have 140 calculations running in parallel. And we can see them already happening. And these term output files will contain the line number that corresponds to the variable combination that was computed. So already we've uh, finished with our 140 calculations because all of them were done in parallel. All right, um, I see that we're already close to the hour. So I will do like I uh, suggested, I will jump over this section on new parallel because I really want to talk a little bit about trajectory post-processing and then we'll still have a few minutes to answer questions uh, if any remain. So when you uh, do large numbers of analysis with Gromax on clusters, sometimes your trajectory analysis will actually be limited by the uh, speed at which you can read the trajectory from the disk. We say that the analysis is IO limited for input output. This is frequent for simple analysis. For instance, here we computed distance time series. Well, computing a distance just needs uh, getting two positions and making the difference, that's pretty simple. Typically, distance calculations are IO limited. More complex things like computing, say, the uh, solvent accessible surface area definitely are not IO limited. But it will happen to you sometimes that your trajectory will be slowed down just by how big the file is and how long it takes to read it into memory. Another thing to consider is that trajectory compression slows down analysis. Gromax will typically use the XTC format when recording simulations because it takes less space. However, before you can read the coordinates, these frames must be decompressed, which slows down your analysis. This means that if you do some clever post-processing, you can actually get much faster analysis. You can remove the atoms that you don't use during the analysis so that the trajectory is smaller, and will be faster to read. So typically that means getting rid of the solvent, water molecules or whatever you use. Uh, here, we were computing our MSDs of water molecules, so we couldn't get rid of the solvent. But if you're only interested in your protein, host process your trajectory and keep only the protein. Uh, second thing to do is to use an uncompressed file format. Gromax uses the TRR uh, file format for uncompressed trajectories, and these are much faster to read. Once you've post-processed your trajectories, they can be stored in slash scratch. Um, this is better because scratch is built for intensive read-write operations on large files. And of course, trajectories are large files. And since your trajectories are just uh, made from the post-processing, you can recreate them easily from the original simulations. Therefore, you don't need a backup. They are just temporary files that you will remove once you're done with the analysis. So really, Scratch is the ideal location. Just remember that inactive files are purged regularly from Scratch. Um, one last remark too on post-processing trajectories. Be very careful if you're post-processing compressed trajectories. Um, it's better not to output to another compressed trajectory because that can lead to uh, accumulating loss of precision. When Gromax saves a trajectory to an XTC file format, the coordinates are rounded up. If you read this XTC file, manipulate the coordinates, and then save them to another XTC, the coordinates, well, the modified coordinates will be um, rounded again, which means that at some point, you will um, start accumulating loss of precision. Let's do one last example where we'll perform the same backbone RMSD calculations, 
but for two trajectories, one that is, um, well, the original trajectory from the simulation and another resulting from post-processing. I have a script here to extract the protein and therefore remove the solvent from the trajectory. Let's run this. And we'll see that I have my original tragcom.xtc. Now I'm creating trash protein, so containing only the protein. And I'm also using the TRR extension so that the trajectory is uncompressed. Then I will compute the RMSD using another uh, pre-written script called R uh, time RMSD. And this one will do the two RMSD calculations one after the other using the two files. And we'll compare them and see which one was faster. I will use the time command to have a record of how long it took for each of the calculation. So let's have a look at this timed RMSD. I'm running RMSD using the original trajectory and using the trajectory with only the protein. Now we'll see what happens when we use a small TRR instead of a big XTC? This should take only half a minute top. Okay. So I know that the output of the uh, time command can, uh, will include the real time or the clock time it took to compute. So the first calculation done with the original XTC took 14 seconds to complete, while the one on the small TRR took only a little over one second. So that's an order of magnitude faster when I use a post-process trajectory that is small and uncompressed. So I really suggest that you do the same for your analysis. I see that we're... Um, at the hour, we have no more time left. Uh, however, I'm fine to stick around a little bit and answer any more questions that you might have. Um, if you download the PDF, you will see that there are other sections that we didn't go over use for using uh, New Parallel. New Parallel is a nice little tool that allows you to pack very short uh, calculations together in a single job script. And when the Gromax tools aren't enough and they feel a bit limiting, you can resort to different packages. Here, I give um, two examples for MD analysis, which is in Python. You can use it to replace the Gromax tools or just to uh, supplement them. One of the examples actually produces index files that are compatible with the uh, Gromax tools. So thank you. And I hope this was interesting. As I said, I will um, try to answer questions if there are any more. And otherwise, I'll give it back to you, Alex. Thank you.